Okay, let's open our Bibles to John chapter six. Jesus the God-man, Jesus in the book of John. This is lesson number 15. Wow. Lesson number 15. Now I've said to you this entire chapter is really a dialogue between Jesus and the crowd that followed Him, Jesus and the disciples, Jesus and His apostles. This is what this chapter, it's a very long chapter. And so far, let's uh, take a look at the uh, sequence of events here of what, we, uh, of what we've kind of talked about. First of all, it, it starts with Him uh, performing two miracles, one public miracle, the uh, feeding the, the 5,000, and the other one, a private miracle where He walks on water in front of His apostles to, you know, to uh, confirm His claim of divinity. Then uh, the dialogue starts, the crowd asks for more proof. They want a bigger miracle. Not enough, you know, that miracle wasn't good enough. They want a bigger miracle if they're going to really believe and trust in Him. And so in response, Jesus promises righteousness. In other words, acceptance before God and eternal life to those who believe. Never mind getting another miracle. Here's what people who believe now, here's what they're going to receive. And so when he tells them that, then the crowd comes back to him and they begin to be hostile at his presumption to, you know, they're saying, who are you to offer us eternal life? You know, we, we know who you are, you, you're, from, you're one of us, you're from here, we know your brothers, we know your mother, you know, your sisters. And then Jesus, again, not referring to what they're saying, he declares that the promise of eternal life and righteousness has always been and is now continually offered on the basis of faith. So that's kind of you know, what we've been looking at in our, in our study of this chapter. Now I did explain to you that faith, you know, the, the essence of faith, is accepting as true what God says or what God does or what God is going to do based on the information that He's given us. So if someone says, you know, what's, you know, how do I believe, you know, what is faith? Well, it's believing that something is true, that's faith, based on the evidence given to you. And God gives us, God gives us evidence. He, 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 you know, he, um, he sets out the evidence. Of course, this means that sometimes we're asked to believe even if we don't understand how God does something or how He's going to do something. Some people say, well, I'll believe if you just give me step A, B, C, D, E, you know, if you really break it down for me. Sometimes that happens, but a lot of times God is saying, hey, how about just believing based on the fact that I'm, I'm telling you I'm going to do this. You know, he tells us He's going to give us eternal life, but I mean, has anybody been to heaven? Does, you know, how does that break down physiologically? Well, that's one of the things he tells us to believe based on the idea that he's given that promise to us. So Jesus offers them the opportunity to be united to God forever by faith in Him. And he performs two miracles uh, to demonstrate his ability to make those promises. Hey, if I can walk on water, if I can you know, feed 5,000 with just a little bit of bread uh, and a fish, a couple of fish, if I can do that, then I can do, I can do the other thing as well. So that's the dialogue between Jesus and the crowd. Now we're going to go to the dialogue between Jesus and His disciples, beginning in verse 60. So, so far He's been talking to the crowd at large. But in the final verses of chapter 6, John will telescope into a tighter scene between Jesus and His closer disciples and the conversation that Jesus has with them concerning the miracles and the reaction of the crowd. So we're going to go to John, um, uh, chapter 6, and so he says in verse uh, 60, therefore many of his disciples when they heard this said, this is a difficult statement, who can listen to it? And so, so far Jesus' disciples have only been witnesses to what has been taking place between Jesus and the crowds. They're watching him talk to the crowds. But when Jesus actually claims to give righteousness and eternal life through himself, they just, they can contain themselves no longer and they begin to reconsider their positions. Don't forget, this is where he says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, you know, or you have no life in you. And now the disciples are going, whoa, wait a minute, uh, maybe this is where we're going to get off. 
So it says, you know, a difficult statement, a difficult or a hard statement means something that's stiff or dry or hard to accept or hard to believe. So the whole concept of Jesus' divinity, His ability to confirm both righteousness and eternal life and resurrection through faith in Himself, that was just too much. That was just too much for them to take in all at once. They just couldn't take anymore. So I want you to note the interesting process of sifting that's going on here. You know what sifting is? Uh, when you continually refine something until you eliminate all the unwanted matter and you're left only with the purest element, that's sifting. You know, gold miners do this as they sift through all the minerals you know, when they're panning gold, and that's the old fashioned way, but you know, there are huge machines that do that now, so that only the gold nuggets uh, are left. Or researchers who do this as they sift through a mountain of information to find just the most accurate, the most pertinent facts. And so Jesus is doing the same thing with people who follow Him. He's continually sifting them, looking for the gold, looking for the true disciples. And so first, He sifts through the leaders in Jerusalem. When He's talking to the high priests and the Pharisees, He sifts through them to see who's going to believe. Next, he sifts through the crowd in his hometown at Capernaum. They see the miracle, wow, this is great, man, you're going to be our king. And then he says, yes, but you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and, and if you believe in me, I'm going to give you eternal life. Ooh, you know, sifting them. Later on, he's going to sift through his chosen apostles. He's going to sift them too. Even today, he continues to sift through the world and through the church separating the wheat from the chaff. So in this we see another recurring cycle and that is Jesus continually sifting and refining and separating His listeners through the word, through His miracles, and through His ministry. So in the end, Jesus' sifting serves to separate those with faith from those who have no faith, from those who are simply religious hypocrites. Some people just don't believe, they don't believe, they walk away. Some say they believe, but they're not living like they believe. And then others genuinely believe and they're trying to live according to the faith that they have. So now we're going to go from the dialogue between Jesus and the crowd to the dialogue between Jesus and His disciples, those who say they believe and are ready to follow Him. So let's read verse 61 and 62. But Jesus, conscious that His disciples grumbled at this, not the crowd now, his disciples, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? So in effect he says to them, I tell you that I can come from heaven and this makes you stumble? You know when he says you have to eat the, the, the bread that comes from heaven, he comes from heaven? He says, you hear me say that and that makes you stumble, makes you you know, makes you doubt. Actually, the word stumble in the Greek here means to be killed in a trap. You're going along and then a trap catches you and kills you. That's, uh, we think stumble means to trip, but in the Greek it was a, a stronger word. It meant to, to capture and to kill. So in, in essence, uh, I, I say this to you and it traps and kills your faith in me? Of course, this is the sifting process at work. The reason that his statements trap their faith is because their faith is in a man, not in the Son of God. And his statement reveals the shallowness of their faith. They believe the guy, man, this is a great prophet, this guy, are you kidding me? He, he can create food. You know, he can heal the sick, he can even raise the dead. We surely want this guy as president or as king, or yeah, sure, he's the Messiah. But wait a minute, he's saying he's divine. He's saying he's God. Oof, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that. You see, their faith is where it's at. They cannot see how a mere man can actually give life, give righteousness, uh, enable them to resurrect. 
Of course, it would be no problem for God to do this, but they don't yet believe that He's God. That, that's the sticking point. That's why their faith is, is trapped, stuck. They have the same problem. They stumble at the same spot as the crowd did. Until now, they were happy to claim Jesus as their own. You know, he was popular. He took on the leadership. He wasn't afraid of the leadership. He wasn't afraid of the Pharisees and the priests. You know, he was calling them out. He even performed great signs like the old prophets. And so the disciples, yeah, Jesus, he's our boy, he's our man. Yeah, we're all behind him. But now he makes this incredible claim and they're caught short because they're not ready to go this far in their belief in him. So Jesus tells them that they've given up very quickly. He said, man, you guys quitting already? You're already bailing on me? He tells them, what will you do with your unbelief if you see me returning to the place where I said I came from? What are you going to do? I told you I came from heaven. What are you going to do if you see me go back to heaven? What's going to happen then? And of course, we know this, the apostles witnessed that, didn't they? After the resurrection, after the 40 days, so on and so forth, the apostles witnessed Jesus, it says in, uh, in Acts, you know, going up in heaven the same way you know, he will come back. He went up uh, through the clouds. And so he's saying to the disciples, you know, in essence, one day you're going to see me go back to heaven where I said I'm from. What are you going to do with your disbelief then? And so in verse um, 63, he says, it is the spirit, Jesus says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit, they are life. So they can't accept that he can actually give life because they believe he's just a man. And he agrees with them. He's not a ghost, he's not an appearance, he's, he's not just the reflection of a human being, he is a full man, living, breathing man. As a matter of fact, that was one of the heresies in the first century. One of the first heresies to begin in the early church was that Jesus wasn't really a man. You know, he was a reflection of a man. He was a kind of a ghost type, you know, hologram, you know what I mean, type thing. Because in Greek philosophy at the time, you know, a spirit, a flesh, they were two separate things. They couldn't be united into one being. And so that idea began to creep into the church and the heresy began that he wasn't really, a, you know, throughout history it's always the same thing. He's either not really a man or he's either not really God. Is, uh, you know, they go around, there's no other way to go. It's one or the other. The heresies always are like that. And of course the Bible teaches, no, he was both fully man and fully divine in one being. So he says to them, look, it's the spirit who gives life. Mere human flesh has no power to revive the dead or to create life. Only the spirit can do this. If I were only a man, Jesus says, I couldn't do any of these things. That's why he says, you know, it's not that the flesh profits nothing, it's the spirit. Not the flesh that's going to give you eternal life. It's not me as a man that's going to forgive your sins. That's, the spirit is going to do this. The spirit does these things, he says, through me and through the words that I speak to you. Therefore, this makes my words, life-giving words, spiritual words, if you take them in through faith. So this is a reference back to the eating the flesh and drinking the blood. Jesus becomes part of you as you take Him in through faith. And you take Him in through faith as you believe as true the things that He has said to you. Okay? That's what He's saying to Him and by extension what He says to us. So the Spirit becomes part of you as you take Him inside of you by believing the words that the Spirit has spoken through Christ. And so we keep going, 60, remember, dialogue, going back and forth here. In 64 it says, but there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray Him. And He was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to Me unless it has been granted Him uh, by the Father. So Jesus makes another divine witness of His person by claiming to know their hearts. You know, he's calling it. He said, you know, I know who doesn't believe. Well, you know, I mean, isn't that a private, personal thing? It's in your heart. He tells them that he knows who follows him 
and He also knows why people follow Him. This would mean that He not only knew who would betray Him, but would also know when that thought would arise in that person's heart. So Jesus was capable of knowing this and he tells them that he's able. So listen, think now. These guys are like, you know, uh, they're like a, a half gallon can with 10 gallons of water being poured in. You know, they're just, it's overflowing, they can't take it. Not only does he say he's from heaven, he also says, and I'm going to give you eternal life and I'm going to give you forgiveness. You know, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And now he says, I even know what you're thinking. As if it wasn't enough, he says, I even know what you're thinking. I even know which one of you is going to betray me. So some people use this passage to promote, and I'm going to open a little sub file here, okay? Let's just stop what we're talking about, the dialogue, move over. I want to make a doctrinal point here. Some people use this particular passage to promote the idea that God chooses or calls certain people and He rejects others. Uh, it's a, there is a biblical doctrine of predestination, God knows in advance, you know, so on. there is a biblical doctrine, but there's also uh, a, twisted, a twist on that particular doctrine uh, that some groups, uh, Presbyterians, Calvinists, use that says God chooses some to be saved, they have nothing to say about it, they're just, He chooses, and others He chooses, they're not going to be saved. Okay, so in this crowd, okay, you, you, definitely not Steve, you, okay, you know what I'm saying? That's how it works. So they use this particular passage to support their idea because Jesus is saying all the ones the Father calls to Him. So they say, look, look, see, it says it right there. You know, the Father's calling people, choosing people, but that's not what Jesus is saying in context. What Jesus is telling His listeners is that without God permitting the truth to be known, no one could know what the truth is. That's how God calls people. He doesn't just arbitrarily select you know, every other one for salvation. The way He calls us is He permits the truth to go out there. He sends Jesus. And so the Father grants us to come to Him by making the truth known. This is how God calls us or draws us or permits us to come to Him by believing in His Son. Had He not done this, we would not have found Him on our own. We wouldn't have figured this out. Without the Bible, we would not have figured out, you know, I, let me see, how can I get to heaven? You know what, oh, may, maybe if God's Son would come, die on a cross to pay for my, we would have never figured that out. Bible says even the angels, Peter I believe it is, uh, even the angels longed to look into these matters. In other words, even the angels didn't know that plan. So if the angels who are in the presence of God couldn't figure out what the plan of salvation was, you know, that Jesus would come and die for sin, so, well imagine we don't have any chance whatsoever to figure it out. All right, so, so now you know, the disciples are doubting, they're saying, man, I don't know if we can stay with you, that's a lot. You've given us a lot to think about. And then Jesus comes back and said, hey, you know, if you can't believe this, well, how about if I go up and down from heaven? Will you, you know? And now we come back to the disciples again, the response of the disciples in 66, uh, say the following, as a result of this, many of disciples, many of His disciples withdrew and were not walking with Him anymore. In other words, they quit. They wouldn't be counted among His disciples anymore. Why? Because Jesus rejected them. He said that if they didn't believe in Him now, they were never disciples to begin with. They were just along for the ride. So once they realized that Jesus knew that they were not disciples inwardly, they simply stopped pretending that they were disciples outwardly. So that, that's the result of the sifting. It's like, gotcha. You're pretending you're my disciples? Okay, let's see how well you do through the sifter. And so he outs them, he reveals them, that they, they, really, they really weren't disciples. He pushes them to the point where they finally acknowledge, well, yeah, I never really did believe. Now, it doesn't say it here, but what do you think happened to those who quit? Well, very simple, they, they just went back to their old lives. They went back to fisher, being fishermen and farmers and shepherds and homemakers and servants of the king. 
you know, picking up where they left off before they began their walk with Jesus. People who leave the church, people who abandon Christ, what do you think they do? They don't go into a cave somewhere. They just go on with their lives. You know? The hole that is left there by their faith, they try to fill that with something else. Hobbies, activities, getting busy, making money, whatever. But only faith in Christ and obedience to Him can fill the hole that is empty. All right, we got to keep going. Verse 67, now Jesus talked to the crowd, talked to the disciples, now He turns His attention to the apostles, because those are the ones He chose. Verse 67, He says, so Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Now it's the apostles' turn to be sifted. The leaders are against him, the crowd is hostile, the people in the synagogue are skeptical, he's losing his disciples, so now he challenges his chosen apostles. He points out what is happening and says, you see the crowds leaving me? Does this shake your faith? The neighbors, the friends, the cousins, the relatives, the shaky disciples, all of them are leaving because the going was starting to get a little rough. Were they going to follow in suit? And so listen to the apostles' response, 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You know, bless his soul, bless his soul, Peter, you know, speaks up, impetuous Peter. He speaks up with a faith not yet fully mature, but a faith never, nevertheless. Note that Peter says no, they wouldn't leave, but for two very distinct reasons. First of all, they got nowhere to go. Where are they going to go? They have nowhere to go where they can find life-giving words. In other words, who, who else is? <laughs> They've watched him speak to their religious leaders. And they've seen how he is just miles ahead and above their so-called religious experts and leaders. And so as far as faith or religion or spiritual things, where are we going to go? We can't go back to the Pharisees and to the priests. We can't go back there. Now, they could have gone back to the fishing business, back to the simple life along the Sea of Galilee. They had a place to go, but not one that offered them the life that Jesus offered. I mean, only with Jesus did they have the words of life. I often say that, you know, some people grow up in the church and others like myself and some of you become Christians as full adults. I was 30 years, 30 years old when I, became, uh, when I became a Christian and when I was early in my faith, I had the same kind of moment with my family and others who said, well, what is this, a fad? What are you going through? You know? And I said, listen, who else is offering to me personally with my life, my messed up life, who else is offering me that when I die, I will resurrect and live forever? Somebody got a better deal than that? And I had you know, studied and looked at other, quote, religions, you know, meditation, Eastern religions, looked at all that kind of stuff. I said, nobody's got a better deal. So I really get what Peter is saying here. There's nowhere to go. This is the best deal we're being offered. And then secondly, they believed what Jesus said, even if they didn't quite understand it all yet. Oh, so important. They had seen the miracle, they had heard the words, and they were putting two and two together. So Peter articulates the thinking of the group by confessing that they are in the process of knowing Him, not only as a man, but as the one uh, Jesus claims to be, and that's the Holy One. When He says the Holy One, He's saying, it, He's not just saying you're a holy person, you're a pious person. No, no. The Holy One is the Promised One, the Messiah. You're that guy. You're that guy. We've seen the miracles. We've heard you speak. I mean, no one else can speak the way you speak. So listen, Peter didn't know any more than the crowd knew about how things were done. I mean, he didn't know how Jesus would give eternal life, but based on the evidence that he did provide, 
he was willing to believe and trust God for what he didn't know. So God gives you enough to believe despite the things you don't know yet. Sometimes we want to know everything before we believe. But Jesus calls on us to believe so that we can know. Remember what I told you? Faith comes before knowledge. And in our world we want knowledge first. We want all the facts and then we'll decide if we believe or not. But that's not how it works in Christianity. God gives you the gospel and you've got to take a step of faith. And every time you take a step of faith, not just to be baptized or whatever, but you take a step of faith, He gives you knowledge. You take another step of faith, He gives you more knowledge, more insight, and so on and so forth. All right, so now Jesus' response back to the apostles based on what they just said, and that finishes out the chapter. So Jesus answered them, did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So Peter had spoken for all of them and all of them by their silence showed that they agreed with Peter. Nobody said, well, that's Peter. He believes you're the Holy One, but I'm not sure yet. No, 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 no. He spoke, no one said anything. So you know, by consent, all of them were saying, I believe, but listen now. I mean, Judas was there. He didn't say a word either. So Jesus said, yeah, you believe. But you know what? I know which one of you is lying. I know which one of you is lying. Now their reward for this step of faith is yet another demonstration of Jesus' divine nature. See the step they took? They said, I believe. L look what Jesus does. He tells them not only is He aware of His true disciples, He's also aware of His betrayer as well. He knows which ones have spoken the truth about their faith and which one has kept his disbelief in secret. Some people who like to save Judas, I've, I've seen people argue, oh, well, you never know Judas, you know. I mean, Jesus is talking to Judas. You realize Judas has a chance there to say like that, that, like that father said, Lord, I, I believe, but help my disbelief. He had a chance to say, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not sure, help me. He didn't. So John clarifies for the reader who the person was eventually known to be, showing that Jesus accurately revealed that he would be betrayed. So let's quickly summarize the last section of the dialogue because it went back and forth, back and forth, all right? So Jesus calls on the people to have faith in Him in order to receive eternal life. He declares that those who do not have faith are not really His disciples. Many who claim to be His disciples leave Him at this point. So Jesus calls on the apostles for their reaction. Peter, in speaking for the twelve, declares his belief in Jesus and, of course, as the Messiah of God. And then Jesus accepts their acknowledgement of his person and gives further proof by claiming to discern the heart of the traitor among them, a claim later confirmed that Judas was the traitor. All right, we have four, four or five minutes left. Some important lessons we can draw from this personal exchange between Jesus and His disciples. Lesson number one, we cannot judge the heart. Jesus showed us that only God can discern the motives of the heart. He's the only one. And yet, that's our most common activity, isn't it? We decide how people are thinking. We decide. We, we pass judgment on their motives. Imagine that. Our task as Christians is to share our faith, to love others, and to serve where and when we can in Christ's name. That's our job. That's the only job we've been given. We spend way too much time trying to figure out motives of the heart and not enough time in loving service. God judges the hearts. We have other things to do. And in the religious world, that's even our, one of our main things, you know, deciding who's Who's going to heaven and who's not going? Nobody gave us that job. Who, who said we had that job? Our task is just to proclaim the gospel in all of its glory and all of its simplicity. That's our job. God will judge those who, He knows who believes, who doesn't believe. He, he'll know even within the church who's just play acting and who's really sincere. It's a great burden lifted off your heart when you realize, hey, I'm not responsible for judging. Now, 
I am responsible for calling out my brother or sister if they're in sin and if they're putting their soul in jeopardy, but that's an act of love. I'm talking about just sitting around you know, and debating who's in and who's out. All right, lesson number two. You cannot fool God. I mean, that would seem pretty evident, right? You can't fool God, but it's amazing how many people think they're, they're doing it. If God knows the heart, you can't fake Him out. If Jesus knew about Judas then, he knows who the Judases are now. You know, Judas refused to believe and he refused to repent. So we, we have to be careful not to be like him, too proud, too stubborn to repent and receive eternal life from Christ. And then maybe one other lesson here. I don't know how many times Jesus said it. You must eat his flesh and drink his blood for life. Now Paul the Apostle explains in Romans 10:17. He says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ. So Paul is the one who kind of breaks this down for us. This is how you receive and this is how you maintain spiritual life, by hearing the words of Christ continually. That's how it's done. So coming to Bible class or attending a workshop or going to worship or making you know, room for a Wednesday night service or regular Bible reading, these are all you know, wearying to the flesh. Do you not feel like coming to Bible class on Sunday morning? You know what that means? That means you're probably normal as a human being because it means you've got to get up early on your day off. And if you have small children, you've know, you got to get them ready against their will. And you, you know, you've got to drive. It's a beautiful morning. Those who play golf, you know, this will be a nice day to be out in the course or wash your car, or you know, have a coffee and just linger out on the patio, of course. And if Wednesday night church is inconvenient, uh, yeah, <laughs> of course it's inconvenient. It's not meant to be inconvenient, but it is, because we live in such a fast pace. We got stuff to do, stopping everything and taking two hours out for fellowship and Bible study and service, you know, that's so inconvenient. But it isn't God who's making it inconvenient, it's the world that makes it incon inconvenient. And unfortunately, there's no other way of having the word preached to us. There's no other way of immersing ourselves in God's word and to be with God's people without carving out a piece of time, you know, a couple of times a week in order to, uh, in order to do that. Um, just remember that the flesh is weak and dying. It's the spirit that lives. It's the spirit that lives on in eternal life. It's the flesh that finds it inconvenient. It's the flesh that would rather do something else. Okay? Just remember, that's normal. If you feel that way, it's no, it doesn't mean you're a bad person, it just means you're normal. Even a preacher sometimes you know, would say, you know, I'd love to take this Sunday off, stay in bed. Yeah, everybody feels like that from time to time. As I say, remember, it's your spirit that profits, not your flesh. The word that you hear stimulates spiritual life and growth like, uh, and growth rather, like love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and self-control. These things are not gained through the flesh, but rather through the word that is affecting your spirit. People fall away for one main reason. They fall away from Christ for one main reason, and that is they don't feed their spirit. They don't open their Bibles ever. They don't attend regularly. Soon they begin to doubt Christ and become like those, the Bible says, no longer walked with Him. I mean, I could, I've got members lists from 10 years ago. I just flipped through it and said, yeah, gone, 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 gone to heaven, gone to heaven, just gone. So let's, let's, let's eat and drink regularly what uh, is spiritual so that we can maintain a healthy and a growing spirit and protect the most valuable thing that we have, which is our, which is our souls. All right, so there we go. We finished chapter six, very long chapter, 71 verses. Uh, we'll move on uh, with the Jesus the God-man next week. All right, thanks for being with us.